Okay, while uh, all the panelists are getting set, I will. Uh, <coughs> uh, I, um, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, introduce each of the panelists, ask them to take uh, just a minute or so to to uh, provide a little background on on who they are and what they've got, and then. Uh, um, I'm going to ask each of them a, a question, let them tee off on something that they, they really like, and then we may circle back around and move in some other directions. Um, so as putting this panel together, one of the things I realize is that, that, that uh, as, uh, as, we've, as we've noted, uh, mid middle managers are, are wrestling with a lot of work-family integration, work-family balance issues, and they're at a point in their life where they're also beginning to reevaluate their careers. And this is often the point at which uh, other things career-related happen, like the invitation to, to work abroad to take on an international assignment or to take on a, uh, a work responsibility that requires uh, a significantly greater dedication of time and travel. And, um, <clears throat> and what, uh, what struck me as I've been out talking to many of these middle managers is many of them are saying no to that. Um, or saying, I have doubts about that, raising questions. And this is a particular challenge. What do you do when those people you have, uh, you have identified as being the future leaders of the organization say, say no to leadership? Uh, or at least uh, the, the path that you have planned for them to leadership. So um, with that in mind, we're going to, to, to lead off. I have uh, to my immediate right, Edward Dunn from Tata Consultancy Services. Um, and I'm going to leap over Mila to uh, Steve Fry from Eli Lilly. Uh, so we have two, two executives who are, who are out there pursuing these issues. And, and right in the middle, I've, uh, I, I've placed uh, Mila Lazarova uh, from Simon Fraser University, who will be, uh, who will be the, the, the academic providing a, a different perspective. Mila's, uh, Mila's work has been extensive with regard to a lot of the, the career issues and work, work family integration issues. And so I think she'll bring a, a, a powerful perspective. Um, <clears throat> but Ed, a little about yourself. Why are you here? <laughs> well, you invited me. Uh, <laughs> so um, I had uh, North America Learning Development for Tata Consultancy Services. And uh, all things uh, training related in North America come across my desk. So one of those are the, uh, the points of training for the middle managers, as well as those subordinates to them, and also to the executives that support those middle managers. Mila. Well, I'm Mila Lazarova. I'm stuck between the B and the C. Uh, <laughs> and I am mid-life, mid-career. Uh, I am, an, uh, as Alan mentioned, an associate professor at Simon Fraser University. My research, I've, I, I'm the academic in the group. I bring the academic perspective. My research has been on expatriation. From that, I'd moved to repatriation. And a natural progression was to look at careers, given that these are quite uh, significant in repatriation. Um, and I'm quite excited to be here. Okay. And Steve? Uh, good morning. My name is Steve Fry. I'm with Eli Lilly and Company in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I've been at Lilly my entire career. I've been very fortunate to have moved around uh, the world a couple of times and had a lot of uh, responsibilities with our international uh, business over the years. So this idea of sort of global careers and, and development of people who are capable and had the, had the ability to, to be senior leaders in a global company um, is very important, particularly as we think about the demographics of our business. Clearly, sort of what I call the economic center of the world has been moving east for the last couple of decades. We believe it's going to continue to move east. So if we can't figure out how to be successful uh, in the east, we will not be successful as a company. Um, and then there's much less all the demographic changes in the U.S. So this topic of sort of global leadership is, is very important to us. And of course, Charlie called me and invited me to come. So how can I say <laughs> no to Charlie? <laughs> Okay, thank you. I want to pick up on what you were talking about, Steve, about moving around a lot, because uh, typically as we look at middle, mid, middle managers and we think about uh, the way the companies have developed them, that often has included an international assignment or international work of some sort. And um, <clears throat> with that in mind, I, I thought I would um, lead off with, with a question for, for Mila, because uh, this has been an area she's focused on, and I know that one of the things that she's looked into are the emerging patterns, the, the, the variations in, 
in, in mobility patterns that we, we see this, uh, exp this, uh, this proliferation of, of more short-term assignments, more travel, um, more project work uh, being a, a assignments to virtual project teams and working across time zones. How has that impacted the, the work-life balance that, uh, that, that mid-level managers are, are, are uh, grappling with? And, and what can you tell us from the research? Well, from a research perspective, it's not very rosy when it comes to uh, work-life uh, integration issues. So I don't want to sound like the bad guy. It's all bad. It's really not all bad. There are reasons why companies are doing that. We heard on the panel yesterday that uh, companies have a really hard time recruiting people for longer-term assignments. People are turning them down. Uh, there's some research that it doesn't really matter whether you come from a developing country or developed country. Maybe, not maybe, in developing countries, people are more willing to take on these responsibilities. But even there, the number was something in the vicinity of a third of the people had interested in that, that they were offered those opportunities. So there's a reason why these are being introduced. Uh, from a family or family work-life integration perspective, there's a lot of challenges with these. They do vary by assignment. Uh, mostly people have studied uh, global travelers, so business travelers. And there are issues around managing that aspect of your life, as exciting as it might be. Uh, travel is not insignificant effort. Uh, travel is becoming more difficult with all security measures. It takes a lot of time. Uh, it takes a lot of stamina. It brings a lot of health issues, uh, a lot of stress. Uh, a colleague had interviewed, granted they're in Australia, so they do have a long haul flight to get out of there. Uh, but in the first year of their positions, they had uh, gained an average about 15 to 20 pounds. So there's these physical aspects of that. Uh, family disruption. Uh, on the one hand side, it's wonderful not to have to move the family. On the other hand, uh, you now have uh, uh, perhaps a spouse that's not so happy that they're the only caregiver of the children. You don't get to be there to close the mortgage. You don't get to be there to uh, go to the bank and do whatever needs to be done. Your life when you're back is very intensified. Everything that you could do over a week, now you have to do just within a couple of days. You travel a uh, there, I mean, research is mostly anecdotal, but people talk about lonely nights in hotel rooms, perhaps having a glass of wine too many. Uh, so there's all these issue, issues as well. Uh, working on the road, uh, there's been that trend. There was a recent article that talked about years ago, travel was glamorous. You were traveling business class, you went to the lounge, you were one of 15 in the lounge, you had a glass of wine, you, you worked there. Travel is not so glamorous anymore. Companies do not want you to, to travel uh, business. They try to cut down on that cost. Uh, and all of a sudden, you're stuck between many other people, and you don't have the comfort of working there. Uh, so the, your personal relationships, even outside of the family, also get strained. Uh, single people have a, have a hard time not being single uh, when they do that. So. Is that a good beginning of fertile soil? I, uh, I, I can imagine a happier beginning to our panel. But, uh, I did say it's not all bad, but from that perspective, I, there are a lot of issues. I, I have a note that we're going to circle back around and ask you if there's any upside to, to all of this. So we'll come back to that. But Steve, one of the one of the points that Mila raised and it came up yesterday was the um, the issue of dual career spouses, and perhaps you could address that that question of. Uh, of um, how does that affect what the organization's trying to accomplish and, and, and how, it, how are you trying to manage that or respond to that issue at Eli Lilly? Well, first of all, we certainly see a major difference in this than, let's say, 20 years ago. I mean, it used to be you'd offer somebody a job in a different country 20 years ago, and they would say yes, and then they would go home and talk to their spouse about it that, that evening. I'm exaggerating slightly, right? But we have, we have stories of that that probably didn't work out so well in the end. But the... Um, what, what we try to do with the whole dual career thing is start a conversation very early. And one of the things that we find uh, to be pretty important is the earlier we can identify somebody who might have, that we believe has the potential to do sort of bigger jobs or have global careers, we start talking to them as early in their career as possible. So it's not a surprise when we, when we get to that point. Now, it doesn't always play out exactly the way that you think, and it can, you can have downsides because if somebody thinks they're going to have this global career and then it turns out that maybe they didn't quite have that potential, then you have an issue on your hand in a different way. But the few of those that we have 
are not nearly uh, as significant as being able to get people excited and, and engaged and thinking about what is possible you know, in their 20s. Right? I mean, that's how early we are trying uh, to do this. The other thing about, I mean, nearly everybody has a dual career um, issue now. One of the things that, that we find is it's actually much easier to manage if both people actually work for Eli Lilly and company. Um, and luckily, in, in many places, we have the critical mass that we can, that we can do that. Where we, where we don't, um, because of the early conversations, we try to get their spouse or partner, whatever the case may be, to start to talk to their company as early as possible as well about what might happen with their partner's career. If that all happens, if you can get the dialogue going early, we find it has a much higher likelihood of success. And if you also know that it's not going to be possible, then you can start to think of alternatives rather than just moving people as expatriates. You can start to think of other ways to try to develop them that might not be as robust for their development as actually having a job in a country, but at least it's something to, um, to, to continue their growth. Okay. Thank you. There are a number of issues around that, and, and, and we, I want to come back to that, but Ed, I want to shift directions and, and, and raise another theme. In part, I want to get some themes out there early for the, for, for, the, for the audience to be thinking about. And one of those issues is that in addition to the people we send out on international assignments often from headquarters, um, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot more people who are hired locally, and we're we're recognizing the need to develop them. And uh, one of the challenges there is that often those local hires may begin to question their long term career prospects in the organization. What are the what are what are the prospects for me if I'm working for a company based somewhere else? Uh, <clears throat> typically, we have viewed that from an American or North American or European perspective. And you're working for Tata, which is which is a different organization. Now we have an organization based in India, and you're working in North America. You have lots of hires, and that, that it, can you talk about that challenge for the, for the people that you're that you've got the the local hires, and and how you're addressing those concerns? Sure. Um, so with Tata Consultancy Services, for those that are not familiar with the brand, it's an IT consulting company. We do all types of IT consulting um, across the business. Um, as you can imagine, the customer base here in the U.S. is, is phenomenal. We do utilize a global workforce. A uh, large portion of that is from India. And those that are in the high potential list, they get those opportunities to come to the U.S., so they're very high achieving. It doesn't meet all of our resource needs, so we also hire from the local market. In fact, we're focused on hiring in the local market. But when you look around uh, as an American joining Tata, you definitely want to see that, that, that model. Where am I going from here? And we have that model very well established in India. That model involves international assignments. Well, we found from the US, there's not many managers who want to go live in India for long terms. So the model, we changed. We give them short-term project opportunities, maybe not being based in India, but maybe they travel frequently there. That way they can get a sense of what the business looks like from that side. We also give them opportunity to go to emerging markets, Latin America, throughout South America. We also want to provide those opportunities to support Europe or uh, the, uh, the Nordic countries. So we give them other opportunities as well, just like we do in in India, but the ones in India are generally primarily to, uh, in support of the U.S. or other Asian countries. So we've kind of modified it. Now, the success of that are those who are developing long-term careers with TCS. Before, we saw a revolving door, high attrition, and we put a lot of focus in training our managers that are managing these managers in order to handle the diverse teams, as well as making sure that there's a quality in, their, in the hypos, making sure that they're evaluating them fairly. Just because someone works 14 hours doesn't make them, make them a better worker than someone that only works nine, right? So those are the, the steps that we've put in place. Okay, Steve, I'm wondering if you might follow up kind of the, back to what I'll call the, the, the model we're more familiar with, which is an American-based company and, and employees over uh, in local operations outside the U.S. 
Yeah, look, I, I think actually one of the things that is one of the most difficult conversations I've ever had is when you talk to somebody about sort of leaving their country when you know that there's nothing that is going to be as a big job for them to go back to if they if they come to the U.S. And and we have that in every country. Now, maybe with the exception of Japan and China, which for us are now growing to be massive organizations because of the opportunities in those markets. But you go to any of the European countries, anything in the, in the emerging markets, and you hire a talent who wants to do really big things, it's likely not going to happen in their country. So, the, so even when we recruit uh, very early on, I, I mean, you're, you'll hear a theme here, sort of early identification and having conversations early, because even when we recruit and we get a talent that we think is going to do big things, we are already talking to them in the recruiting process about you know, sort of nearly every road leads to, in, leads to Indianapolis, Indiana. So if you have an interest in that, terrific. Um, if you don't, maybe you come with us for a while, but if you need to be in, you know, you, you choose a country, Argentina, for your life, I mean, you're, you're likely not going to want to stay with us forever. And I think just that transparency, um, again, very early on, it, it makes, a, makes a big difference, both in their confidence and their trust in, in the company and in, and in Lilly. Um, but also so they have a clear path of what they might want to do. Oftentimes what we find is if we, if we start that conversation early, people are willing to come to Indianapolis in, in this particular case or to relocate. They just need time to, to plan that and have it sort of be integrated into their life plan. Um, that's our experience. Okay. Thank you. We, we've touched upon a, two, two issues. One is the... Uh, the issue of work family integration. Uh, the second one we've been talking about are really the, the career progression, career development issues. I'd, I'd like to pull out a, a third, and, and that is uh, when, I, when I speak with, uh, with mid-level managers, often um, they recognize the need to develop, the, the need to become more global, to, uh, to uh, hone their skills and their capabilities uh, but they're not always clear about the best way to go about that. And given all of the competing demands they have and, 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 uh, and responsibilities they have, the, the path's not, not always clear. And, uh, and I, I'll ask uh, Mila to start off on this, but I want, I'd like each of the panel members to address this. Um, companies, and, and I think you noted this uh, earlier, Steve, companies have, have tended to base that, uh, that the, the primary development developmental responsibility on, on the international assignment, getting them out there involved in that. And so, so Mila, my, my question to you is, um, is, is that international assignment, is immersion in a foreign setting essential uh, based, on, based on your research and, and your, your knowledge of the research? Is, is that essential for developing global leadership capabilities in these middle managers? Are there other are there other approaches that, that can be taken? Very short answer to that question is yes. Uh, but then from that point forward, uh, there are options. So uh, first of all, just to kind of echo on what you were saying, the uh, research uh, suggests that uh, assignees have become much younger over the last 15 years. They have become unattached over the last few years. So some of the trends you're talking about, you definitely see reflected. Uh, for, for reasons that, that, that we spoke about. Um, and uh, research really done uh, by some people in the room suggests that uh, very much like we talked about the 10, 20, 80 yesterday, uh, cross-cultural training research suggests it's more of a 20, 30, 50, if I remember correctly, that about 20% of your competencies you can get in a classroom, about 30% of cross-cultural competencies can be well developed with interaction of, uh, with others, but really a big chunk of them have to be experiential. Uh, now, what is immersion? Uh, being in a country for a year, working in an, uh, living in an expat compound and going to the office every day, that's not necessarily immersion. So it's high contact experiences, as Paula Caligiuri uh, work has suggested, that have an impact. It's high contact that has an impact. I would suggest that the first thing companies do is check out, uh, you know, a Northeastern and a volunteerism program that is designed in a way to provide a rich and deeper experience that doesn't necessarily span over three years, uh, but would give you a lot of the, um, a, a lot, it will open a door. 
it will open a door that you can then continue to walk through to build uh, these expertise and experiences. By, by the way, that was not a planned that was not a planned commercial announcement. I do not for, get paid for this. <laughs> For for, for for Paula's work, but she is here, and I would encourage you to talk with her about it. I mean, uh, it is at the it is at the fore line of research. I mean, that's that's what's being done right now, and uh, the research also has suggested that there's a burgeoning research on biculturalism right now, and sort of early experiences and how that shapes a person, uh, and the fact that they would have unique skills that, uh, or there might also be a, a group that uh, you take and it's easier to build uh, competencies based on that. I think along that line, if you don't mind, um, I think the conversation that we have with our employees is we also have to remember that middle managers, at least in my organization, aren't all people managers. They're individual contributors. These are very techie people that have no interest in ever managing anyone. And I have to keep that in mind as they're identified as high potential just as those who are managing others. The others uh, are people managers, and there's a career path for them. And then there's this uh, third group, that indirect of manage, uh, management of people, right? These are project-orientated people. They're in our horizontals. We need to look out for all career paths because we can't say that somebody who is a middle manager in their mid-career and they don't want to take on these additional assignments, although he's performing very well, we also need to have that conversation. What is it they, do, they want to do? And we develop those competencies. If they want to people manage, there's a set of competencies that that as an individual contributor will never have to go through, right? They, they want to become a, a developer, an architect, and they want that career path. This other group that's in the support, maybe they need much more project management competencies and orientation. Now, along that, we have to balance it. And I think we also have to give them the opportunity to get that education. And in our world, it's all about billable. In this consultant space, it's always chasing that next deal, chasing the next project. We also got to be cognizant that there is this work-life integration, and that's an important part because the company who cares for them is going to get that in return from its employees. So I think we need to make sure that there's a balance from our side that we're not saying, yes, you're a hypo. Now go take this training as you're working 50 and 60 hours a week. Go take on this training because they're not going to be happy there either. So I think that balance also needs to be in play. Steve? Yeah, first of all, um, I would suggest that I, I don't think there's anything nearly as, as beneficial for somebody who's going to be a leader in a, in a global company than, than being an expat in a, in a couple of other uh, places. In our business, it gives you a feel for a completely different healthcare system um, because the U.S. Is, is itself, every other country has something different. And if you only experience one, one marketplace, how do you possibly make decisions and lead globally. I mean, I could give you all kinds of stories about how we failed in, in Asia for, for many years in many countries because we just didn't understand what it took to do product development in those countries. I mean, we, we were launching products uh, five plus years after we were launching them in, in the U.S. and Europe. And now we've done a lot of work to close that gap, but it was solely because we didn't understand the marketplace and we were doing things as if it was America and it wasn't. America. Um, so to, to me, there's nothing, and in, in our experience, there's nothing that will, that will do what an expat assignment does. Interestingly, we'd, we've done a lot of research for some of our key senior leaders to say, what are the experiences that are most beneficial and correlate the most to success in some of our big general management, big business unit kind of leadership roles? And the one that the one experience is to go to another country and sit on the lead team of an affiliate and experience what it's like to work in another country for a, for somebody who for a general manager who is running on that. So you just get a you get a sense and a, and a feel for that. If you're successful with that, it means you're likely going to be successful in, in bigger jobs. Now, realizing that from so from our experience, there's nothing that sort of takes the place of an expat uh, assignment. But there are things that we know that everybody can't do that, so there are other things that we think are, are beneficial. You know, when we run a lot of our leadership development programs, we run them globally. We have a, a mix of sort of a third of, of the people from the U.S. and two-thirds people from around the world who come together for a week. What, it's, it's not just the intervention of the, of the leadership program, but it's a formation of a group that hopefully establish a bond 
and stay together and start to communicate their, their entire careers with each other. We find that very beneficial. We are very um, explicit about how we want to form and, and, the, and the people who we invite to these teams. And if people, if, if we don't have the right composition, we go to get the right composition. Um, interestingly, and this, this whole idea of, of, of leading cross-culturally, in Indianapolis, Indiana, in our headquarters, we speak 56 languages in, in, in our headquarters. Um, now, a lot of it is because of our research orientation and some of the skill sets that we require. But even if you're in Indianapolis, Indiana, if you don't understand how to lead cross-culturally, you're going to fail as, as, as a leader because half of your team, three-quarters of your team, might not be from your, from your country. So we do a lot of work to also um, help just with cross-cultural cross -cultural awareness um, and those kinds of things to help supervisors lead on, on a global basis, even if your team happens to sit within your laboratory. I'm going to um, I want to stay with this theme about uh, about the individual and, and, and how we develop them. And um, <clears throat> I had an interesting experience, which which has been replicated several times. And, and I would be interested in the panel's uh, perspective on that. Uh, and that is working with a, with, with, a, with a group of middle managers in a, in a program called Global Leadership Development. And uh, everybody in the room is a, is, a, is a high potential. And I ask the question, how many of you see yourself as global leaders? So these are mid-level mid managers, many of them with international responsibility. And when I ask that question, how do you see yourself as global leaders? Um, in a room of 50, only one person raised their hand. And I thought, now this is interesting. We have, uh, we have managers who are in a program that clearly designates them as global leaders. We, 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 have a, we have an HR development officer there who's informed them that the purpose of the program is to help them continue along their path to global leadership development. And 49 of them don't see themselves as global leaders. 95% of, uh, of the group don't see themselves. How can companies address that issue of, of developing that mindset and that, that perspective? that encourages middle managers to see themselves as global leaders or see themselves on a path to global leadership? <clears throat> and we'll call that a toss-up question. <laughs> well, I think, first of all, in my organization, it would be around uh, empowering them to, uh, to show that they're influencers. Um, it's not just their interaction with the various countries and, um, and and projects as in the IT consultant space in a global delivery model, you have multiple accounts or multiple project people across the globe. And I think the definition, first of all, uh, would need to be spelled out. And that's what we do is talk about them in a global leadership role as being influencers. It's not only the decisions that you make, but actually influencing them. And what that simply means is uh, their approach to the work or approach to the project, empowering those that support them. So from a global, a global leadership position, it will it would take, take shape. And I think those who would not be able to see themselves as a global leader, maybe the definition would uh, need to be explained. I know we put a lot of effort into it because those are, those are people in positions that just manage people around the globe. And then there are the global leaders. Um, some of them may not see themselves as that, but once they get into our program, um, they get it spelled out very quickly. Not only are they working across the globe, but they are then empowering those that are working under them. They're also seeing themselves in influential uh, space. We provide them additional training opportunities to see others within the organization and even outside. So I think that's part of it. That's where we start. Um, and then, of course, um, assessing as we go along to make sure that we're getting the results from them. They're stepping up. They're, they're making, those, um, uh, making that commitment. And then I think the other part is uh, making sure it's where they want to go. Some kind of get in that position, and then they look back and go, wait a minute. It's not for me. And that's fine as well because you can't always be correct in the future. 
Well, I mean, I don't know the specific, uh, obviously, details of that. You know, the academic in me wants to ask you more questions to find out why that happened. Uh, but the uh, the research that that, I, that I've looked at that looks at uh, global, global leadership development programs, actually, the latest piece was suggested something quite different from what you said. There was a very interesting case study comparing two Nordic organizations. And the name of the article was Developing, you know, Intellectual and Social Capital or Developing Prima Donnas. So, uh, and the, the point really was that you need to design a program like that very closely fitting with the organizational structure. You need to have management involved from the very beginning to do some of the things that you said. Uh, you, and in the Prima Donnas organization, it was a consultant's design, consultant's implemented. The top manager never came into the meeting until meeting three. They were going to very glamorous locations and they were being the annoyed at once. And what ended up happening is they destroyed relationships, they destroyed social capital, they learned about the organization, but then by then nobody wanted to talk to them. So that was a bit defeated, the purpose of that. Whereas humbleness helps, so I wonder if these people were just humble. Uh, but really embedding it with the organization, embedding with the culture organization, knowing why they're doing it, empowering them. Again, I don't know if that is the case, but sometimes, uh, Looking at role models, especially if, you know, if in an American organization people are not American, they want to see the Indian, the Bulgarian, the Romanian, the Vietnamese, uh, that is on the leadership team and identify with that. I can be this. So once you can identify, you can, if there's no Bulgarian or you know, Romanian, or you don't, you don't see that. A woman of my age, I don't think I can do that. So that's also very important. And I think organizations miss that sometimes. Okay. Steve? I'm not sure that I have anything very intelligent to add, actually. The, the, I've never asked this question in front of one of our programs. I'll, I'll, I will ask it because it would be interesting going in to some of our things, how many people would raise their hands and at the end how many people would raise their hands. Um, look, I, I, I do think there's an element, though, as, as uh, my colleagues up here suggested, that I, I'd go back. I think when, when you go out and you recruit and you start to talk to people early um, and have a very transparent, open dialogue, that, that is what is going to either give somebody the perspective of I have a global career or I have a very narrow niche. Um, and, and both are okay to, to, to the point. It's just a matter of making sure you find people who actually do want um, global careers. Because I, you know, one of the things that, that, that I am certainly finding that we are finding is, you know, it used to be there were a lot of people who wanted to be CEO of the company. I mean, now with, I don't know if it's social media, if it's TV, what, you know, what it is, but the drain on you know on the on CEOs of, of Fortune 500 companies it looks exhausting to me, and it looks exhausting to our young talent as well. And I don't think we just don't have as many people who aspire to do that because they see the sacrifice that it takes. And unfortunately, it's one of those things where, it, in my mind, I see it is a sacrifice, right? I mean, if you want one of these big jobs. You, you have to sacrifice other things. You, you can't have, you know, it's not a motherhood and apple pie everywhere. Um, so it is finding the, those people and, and sort of creating this, I don't know if it's a competitive spirit. You know, I agree humility is extremely important, um, certainly in a Midwest company. But you still want some people who, who have that desire and, you know, hopefully they have a little humility as well. But they want to go out and win the race, right? Um, if, you, if you don't start to find that early, I think that, we'll have a bunch of niche people. Thank you. Um, I, have, I have lots of other questions for the panel, but I, I, I'm also aware that there are other people in the room who may have some questions as well. So what I'd like to do at this point is to open up uh, the, the, the panel for some questions from the audience. I, I already have a bid in the back from from Charlie, uh, and I won't ask for a competing bid, but we'll we'll follow up. And I just ask when you uh, if you'd stand, wait for the mic, and then if you'd introduce yourself and your affiliation, just so again that we can connect with one another. So Charlie, go ahead. I'm Charlie Tharp, and I'm a faculty fellow here. But for Steve, one of the points you raised, which uh, we found to be problematic, is that safe landing when someone comes back from a, a global assignment. Um, we hadn't had great success at Bristol Myers Squibb, to be honest. How do you manage that, and what do you do to make that safe landing really happen? Look, I, it's interesting. Having been an expat twice, um, you know, I, I always say that to every expat, well, everyone that I get to talk to before they move, the first three to four weeks is like you're on a long vacation, right? Because you're in a new place, you're out to dinner every night, you're experiencing new things, and all of a sudden, after about a month, 
you sort of, as I describe, you fall off this cliff. Like, gee, me, this, I live here, right? I mean, I have no friends. I have no family. I mean, you know, in some cases, you're driving on the, on the other side of the road, whatever the case may be. And it takes about five, six months to actually climb back up to be in a point of happiness that then surpasses where you were probably when you were at, quote, unquote, home office or, or anywhere else. So we, it's interesting. We provide a lot of support. Historically, we have provided a lot of support for people who are moving to their host country. And we gave no support when somebody was moving back to their home country thinking it's just going to be a smooth landing. Uh, in my two experiences, moving home was about a thousand times more difficult than moving away because one of the other benefits of these expatriate jobs, particularly if you're moving from, let's say, headquarters to, to an affiliate, is that you have a lot more responsibility. You have a lot more autonomy. You don't have somebody looking over your shoulders every day. And people tend to fall in love with those kind of jobs, uh, including me. And then all of a sudden you come back and you're in the maze and the bureaucracy of this, this, the haze of corporate headquarters. And you think, what in the world, what in the world just happened? I want to go back. Um, so we are, we are now providing a lot more support when people move back to their home country, no matter where they might be from, if they, if they go back, to try to help them and even talk to them about it when they move to their expat assignment, about how difficult, you think this is going to be hard. I, trust me, it's going to be harder to move home. Um, the other thing that's interesting for us is, and, and we are still trying to tackle this, is it used to be that we would, one of the things that we also believe in is not just for people to move uh, to different cultures, therefore countries, but also to move cross-functionally and to have experiences outside your home function to give people a broader breath. I mean, I, I'm an IT guy. I joined Lilly as an IT guy, um, did that for seven years, worked in, in HR in, in, the, in the U.S. And, and in London, went to Australia to be our general manager. I, I was our general manager without any sales, marketing, corporate affairs, medical experience. And people probably thought the company had lost its mind, and it probably had. Um, but it was, it, was, it was a completely different um, experience that was difficult. Right? I learned a lot, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly about myself, for sure. And it was a mediocre success. It was probably the first time ever in my career I had what I would call mediocre success. Moving back then was difficult, right, because everybody sort of looked at me differently. Um, so we had sort of lo we lost a little bit of this. Was this for development or was this for so maybe he'll come back and be a quote unquote better HR person, right? Or is this because we want to build him to be a, 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 you know, a bigger general manager? So we are struggling as well with how do you even measure success in expatriate jobs, particularly if they're cross-functional in nature, um, because we, you, we don't have the same tolerance that we once had because the marketplace is just that much more uh, competitive. So the short answer to your question, sorry to ramble, the short answer to your, to your question is we, we work with people, we're now doing more to work with people from the very beginning to say what's it going to like to be back home. We make sure that people have broad sponsorship before we ever send them out as an expatriate. If they, if they do not have broad sponsorship, forget it, because if they are gone for three years and sort of out of sight, out of mind, they will not be um, sort of pulled, pulled back. Um, and then when, when people are out, we have very regimented periodic check-ins with that set of sponsors to make sure they are understanding how they're doing, what results they're producing, how their family's doing, all those sorts of things that we have a sort of a systematic approach to and now. And for us, it's about... 250 expats in an organization the size of about 38,000. So it's, it's, it's a manageable process. Sorry to ramble. If I, if I can follow up on this, and this, for, this is for everyone on the panel. One of the concerns that I've had about international assignments is the sense that um, in some organizations, it, it seems to be a, a superstitious practice, by, by which I mean, there's a, there's a belief that if we send this person on the international assignment, they're going to have this transformative experience and come back and 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 have the you know and have the skills and the growth and development. They'll acquire that leadership potential. But as as Mila, you pointed out earlier, um, not all international assignments are this are, are equal, and uh, there are differences in in the nature of the experiences it have. And and uh, while you were talking, Steve, one of the things that was going through my mind is. How do companies evaluate the, the, the managerial or, or leadership capability growth in, in those employees? 
undoubtedly for, for many there is tremendous growth, but first of all, do companies know what, what sorts of growth they're, 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 they're going to get from that? Do they have a way to, to, to approach that? And then is there, a way to, is there a way to measure it on the other end? And, and Mila? If Can I just give you, again, the, the dark picture of this is, uh, I haven't done research on this myself, <coughs> but whatever I've looked at has said, so ROI is very big right now in expatriation. So uh, evaluating return on investment. Uh, and uh, it shows that every company is interested in doing it about 14 to 20% tops, uh, if you're optimistic, are actually believing they're doing a good job out of it. And I read somewhere that something along the lines of 70% of companies just don't know to don't know how to do this. Uh, and it's very easy to look at the costs, but looking at what you get out of this, it's so much more difficult. So I'm just setting up the state so that we can hear what, <laughs> what, what companies are doing. Um, sure, from, from our uh, middle managers coming over uh, to the US from India, as an example, there, we have a pre-training program that supports not only the associate, but also their family. Uh, it's self-paced. There's some instructor-led aspects of it, but it's really kind of hard to learn something prior to actually getting in this space. So um, we do see the value of it. We have the ROI. It's it's the metrics are all there to say international assignments not only good for their career, it's good for our business because they're getting a chance to be on a client site in a client face. Uh, these roles are so valuable in an IT consultant space because they're going back and then translating that to the back office, to those, those project teams that are on the, in India or in Hungary or wherever. Uh, they can go back and translate that and say, you know, I've been on that client site. I know what it's like. So that ROI is there. The, whether it's a language or understanding the English culture or the American culture, wherever it may be. The other part of it is the... Americans that are going offsite, the ROI for them is entirely different. It's understanding, it's exposure, and getting that ROI and how they integrate within the TCS and, and their longevity career-wise is an advantage. So we measure it differently depending on where they're going, whether it's from India to the U.S. or from America to uh, other countries. So uh, the support there, you did bring up a very, very valid thing, which is when they go back to India. I have heard that we just we don't have that blown out as elaborate as we do when they come to the U.S. So that is something uh, you have brought the light, and I've heard some horror stories. I've heard some good stories. And I think we depend on their family. Uh, the Indian culture itself is very family orientated. And I think we say, oh, well, they're back in their home country. They got all this family and all support for all these young children or whatever the case may be. And we probably could do a better job there. The only thing I will, will add, I'll just give you an anecdote, because we, we probably don't measure this per se and have you know, ROIs or anything else on our expatriate assignments. Um, but let me just give you a couple of anecdotes uh, about this. And, and I'll use Japan as an example. You know, Japan, 10 years ago in our, in our, in this, in our company, we were launching our products five plus years after we were launching them in uh, the United States and in Europe. And Japan was the second largest pharmaceutical market in the world. Right? And we were five years plus late. Um, think about how much sort of revenue we left on the table as a result of that. The reason is, is because nobody in Indianapolis understood what the re real requirements were to do drug development in Japan because of safety measures and the quality standards were, were so much higher than that in, in the Western world. We brought a lot of people to Japan, from Japan to Indianapolis to help us solve that. We sent people from the U.S. to Japan to understand Japan. Now, we, the, the next series of products we will launch, in a couple of cases, we will launch in Japan before we launch in the U.S., and certainly in Japan, we will only launch about six months. There's nothing later than about a six-month lag in our current portfolio. The, the difference that will make to, to our, our company is significant, but even so, the, the, some of the medicines that, that we have are actually more important for the Japanese market, for the Asian market, than they are for the U.S., thinking about gastric cancer in, in particular. So the impact to humanity is much greater by having these products available in countries like Japan, China, the rest of Asia, than it is here. 
Well, that if we would if we would have ignored sort of un, trying to understand that or kept doing the business in the same way, we would still have a five plus year lag <coughs> in in our uh, product launches in 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 Asia. So it's a real live tangible example of how this makes an enormous difference. Now, this this also fits in the U.S. By the way, because at least in our business, uh, the 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 um, incidence of many of the diseases that we are trying to help have a much higher incidence in minority group populations they, than they do in Caucasian. Diabetes is much higher in Latino and African American populations, cardiovascular disease, uh, can, some types of cancer. So it's, it's, it's also for us, this, this, I, this issue of, or this question of diversity is, is so profound for us because if we do not understand what the demographics really require, we are going to miss, miss the boat. Um, so we don't do real hard measures to say, what do we get out of this? Um, what I can say is, is that when we get people who understand the cultures and the markets that we are trying to win in, in a, in a bigger, deeper way, we, we win in a much bigger way. Okay, thank you. Uh, down here. Uh, and then I'll... Hi, uh, uh, Fred Folks, Boston University School of Management. I, I have two questions. What's your experience uh, and what are the best practices with respect to moving women uh, around, around the world? And the second question is, what is your feeling? Because in MBA programs, we have so many very good students from India and China. They want to go home eventually, but they would like to be treated like an expatriate, not a local. Salary administration seems to be always a, sort of a, uh, a big problem. Uh, how do you handle those cases? Um, from my perspective, uh, the women population, let's take that or address that particular segment first. Uh, they're part of our accelerated leadership program just as, uh, as the males are. And we find that it's much more American, not wanting to have long-term term assignments in India as an example. Um, so there's no difference between the men or women. Neither one want to go spend extended time in India. So that's why we've molded the program in which have short-term assignments, three months, six months um, duration, maybe multiple touch points over the course of a year. So we modified it that way because we just didn't find much of an interest. Now, if you give them a European assignment, uh, women, much like men, uh, have no uh, less qualms about going to European countries uh, for longer periods of time. Um, on the other part of it, our, our Indian locals, the ones that we're hiring here, mm -hmm. Um, generally, they're established here. There's not that great of need uh, to go back and live in India. Um, you know, they've made their choice to become U.S. citizens or green card holders, something along that line. Uh, they don't mind visiting, of course. You know, it gives them a chance to reconnect back to India. But it's not uh, something that we see as a glaring need. Even through HR, we're not hearing a lot of it. Uh, in fact, more of it is the other way. They want to extend their assignment here. Uh, because there's an opportunity to take on a larger project or uh, go into a sales role or something like that, or they want to extend it by going to Canada. Maybe that might be something that, that we get addressed every once in a while. Yeah, Canada is another country, right, Mila? Yeah. It is a different country. Uh, it yeah. is. I just want to just want to confirm need that. Need a passport to cross. Um, I mean, just as a, a very a small comment here, there's been only emerging research on um, multinationals from emerging countries and how they manage things like repatriation. And the issue with repatriation, it's been there since, since we know about it, is that support is really, they perceive it low, but they say, I hated it, but I'll do it again, because I absolutely loved it. With uh, multinationals from emerging countries, people going back in a traditional type assignment, they feel some of the same career frustrations, but they also feel they're being listened to more carefully because they have that aura of, if you've been to the States, you've been to London, you probably have something to, to teach us. So there's a slight difference there. Not enough research to say anything conclusive, but they may be having a slightly different experience. Steve? First of all, I apologize. My phone has been going nuts, and the alarm in my house just went off, so I think everything's under control, but I apologize. Um, <laughs> For that, the uh, hopefully and hopefully everything won't be gone when I get back. Um, so I, I sort of I sort of I sort of missed the question. Um, so I, I apologize. <laughs> At least I'm being honest. <laughs> it was what electronics do you actually have? Yeah, well, and the good house? news is, and, and honestly, the good news is, people could have whatever they want in my house because none of it is worth anything anyway. So it's okay. Um. I had a comment, question back here. Yeah. 
Yeah, hello, my name's uh, Mike Lely. I lead uh, Tracks Consulting. I want to go back to the return on investment point. Uh, we developed uh, some metrics around post assignment talent impact, working with a dozen or so companies and with uh, Paula Calajuri. And we looked at measuring both development outcomes and particularly career impact post assignment. I think the results indicated that people feel positively impacted by assignments. Yet the data suggests that a lot of companies aren't really very effective in leveraging it. In fact, uh, from the good end to the bad end, you probably have at least a five times better result at one end compared to the other end. So there must be a really huge leak of, of value. So I liked, I, I heard what Stephen said about the very clear approach you have to setting expectations. And that seemed to, to to make a lot of sense because you're effectively creating a very clear value proposition. So the learnings we have suggest that the vast majority of people who go on assignment believe they're gonna have, it's gonna create a positive career opportunity for them. It's gonna positively impact their careers. So do you feel that the clarity of proposition you're able to provide, in a sense, is positively impacting the kind of things your organization is doing to make those outcomes more likely. Because I think that's what the data suggests for us. While there wasn't a very clear focus on uh, safe landings, Charlie, um, there's some evidence that companies that are at least focused on what it's about instinctively do things that make good outcomes better. And those that don't have that focus really suffer quite badly. Effectively, they identify talent, mobilize it, and lose it. Um, so what are your views on that? I maybe start with this. It, it, this is, I, I think, a very good point because if you look at our, our data, we have some unbelievable success stories with our expatriate community, and we also have some where we spent a lot of money and got very little out of it, right, because it's not that they're, they're all expensive. Um, you know, there are two reasons that we tend to do expatriates. Um, one is we believe somebody has more senior potential in the company, and we think it's an important part of their development to get them some good cross-functional, good cross-functional, or good cross-cultural experience. The other is, is we're we're doing something new in a country, and we just need the technical capability. I.e., we're going to build a new insulin plant in Suzhou, China, and it's hard to get people who have any experience building uh, an insulin plant. So we're going to send you know ten engineers, whoever that we need to help, and then build the local capability as as we do it. Um, both of those are we think are very legitimate. When we send somebody, when we, when our selection process is is good, when we send somebody because it really is a part of their development, we tend to have a great experience and a great outcome. Now, it's a lot of it is anecdotal. We don't have maybe the same measures that you have, but but we have a great experience. When we send somebody because we're really just staffing a job, um, because maybe we've just not done the work locally to 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 look hard enough to staff a job, but the person doesn't have the kind of potential. Um, that, that we would like to have for that kind of assignment. Those are the ones where at the end, everybody scratches their head and say, why did we just spend $3 million to, to send this person to, to London? Um, because they're the same person that, the, the person that went is exactly the same that came back. And it, it all has to do with the selection uh, in, in our experience. Um, if you actually look now, one of the things that we, that we track is one, not just the number of expatriates that we have, but the number of expatriates who have what we call potential in the organization two levels above their current level. Um, and we want that number to be above 70% be because of, again, this sort of need for technical capability. Um, when that number, and, and actually I don't mind if we have 400 expats, if we had 80% of them who had potential at least two levels above, we think it's a great investment. If, if that number dips below, I, I don't want any expats if they, I'm exaggerating, of course, um, if, if they don't have the kind of potential that we, that we see in the company. We are, um, we, we are out of time, but before we, uh, we conclude, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to give the, uh, the, the panel uh, an, an opportunity to make one, one brief closing statement or observation, anything you might have heard uh, in the session today, either from another panel member or uh, might have, might, you know, might have been brought to mind, and I, I particularly want to give Mila a chance to tell us: Is there any upside to international assignments? <laughs> <coughs>
<laughs> we could be here for a long time if I gave you the, the a, a list of the, the, the positive sides. So uh, very much reflecting on so, um, something that was said here, um, I very recently did a very academic exercise of summarizing the literature on repatriation for a book chapter on repatriation. And it, it, it's so 20, 30, 40 years on, you do get to see a lot of excitement over uh, developed skills, uh, but very little in terms of tangible outcomes for individuals. Uh, there are a couple of pieces of research, though. Um, one is not so optimistic. Uh, the other is more optimistic. Um, uh, somebody looked at the CVs of Fortune 500 companies companies and looked at whether having had an international experience slows down or or speeds up the path to the top job and found out that it slowed down the top to the 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 path to the how long it took you to get to the top job on the other hand there was a, a there is also a piece of research that suggested that over 30% now of executives in 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 the US of Fortune 500 have international have had uh, an assignment on their uh, CV uh, uh, and then in Europe, the number is even higher. It's uh, in excess of 65%. And what was even more optimistic from my perspective is that 15 years ago, that number was only 40%. So you definitely see a trend there. So if you are, if you are a middle manager, get all the support you need. Uh, make sure you get the best, uh, the uh, well-designed experience that's developmental in nature and do it because it is very good. And I'd be happy to talk to you more about it over coffee. Okay. Ed? Um, just uh, two points. Um, the first one's for Paula. I would love to understand the neuroscience. <laughs> <laughs> Only those in our dinner group will get that. Uh, the second is, I think we also probably need to explore more around the generational aspect. The Gen Ys moving into uh, this middle management, um, we've seen they're much more adaptive, uh, faster, uh, much more willing to... Um, take assignments, whether they're short-term or long-term. Long I would love to understand that or have a discussion with someone that has a little bit more data around that Gen Y mm -hmm. and their, and their um, transformation on expatriate duties, whether they're coming from India, we're seeing a lot of that, uh, but also the Americans. Um, we're just starting to get a few of those Gen Ys into this uh, position, and they seem a little bit more willing. So I'd love to know any data around that. Steve? Yeah, well, first of all, other than hoping that everything is still in my house when I arrive back in Indianapolis <laughs> later today, um, no, look, it's been a pleasure. Uh, my, my, um, I guess the the from the conversation and, and sort of the my own learning through this over the years is is to really try to understand one why we do this to make sure that we really understand the benefit um, and what we're trying to achieve from from global leadership, from expatriate assignments, from you know how we how we you know run a global leadership program and how we fill the, what are we, what are we really trying to get as an outcome? And then making sure that we do have, um, uh, you know, sort of what I would call all the methods that we think are going to achieve that. And, and then the only other thing to me is, is I think with talent, no matter generational, you know, one of the things that I always get a, a kick out of is when people in my job sort of you say that, you know, we'll never keep somebody at a company for a career anymore. And I kind of sit and say, well, gosh, that's like a really easy excuse where we don't have to do our jobs because mm -hmm. the reason that I am still with Eli Lilly and Company after 28 years are, is, are exactly the same reasons that a lot of the younger generations tell me what they want in a, in a, in a career. They want to learn. They want to develop. They want to change. They want quick. They, they, all this stuff. Well, that's, that's sort of what I wanted 30 years ago. Um, so, I, you know, to me, it's a bit of how, how do we have transparent conversations with people very early in their careers to make sure there's some understanding and alignment about what their goals are, what our goals are, can we achieve those together or not? Um, because the more transparent we are, I believe, very early in someone's career, the more likely we are to develop them to be the kind of global leaders that we believe that we need going forward. Oh, would you please join me in a round of applause for our panel?